Hello, I'm John Little, the man who had the distinct honor of producing and directing Bruce Lee, A Warrior's Journey. The opening sequence of the film, which you'll see in a moment, has special meaning. It's a, sort of a tip of the hat to the late Brandon Lee, who once told me that it was, in his opinion, the greatest fight sequence ever choreographed by his father. This sequence is from Bruce Lee's last completed film, Enter the Dragon, and it truly is magnificent. No cues are given. It is simply a fluid and dynamic human body expressing itself in the art of unarmed combat. Brandon had told me that to his knowledge, only 15 minutes of footage from his father's penultimate film, The Game of Death, had been shot, and that all of it had been included in the film released under the title of Game of Death, which went into the theaters in 1978. Brandon didn't know, and neither did anyone else until 1999, that only 11 minutes and 7 seconds of the footage that his dad shot made it into that film, leaving some 23 minutes of footage which Brandon never saw out of it. So, while it is dedicated to Bruce, it's also for Brandon, that he might, in looking down upon us today, also see the footage that was denied him during his time on Earth. The music, incidentally, that you're hearing now is uh, terrific. It was composed by uh, Wayne Hawkins, who did a magnificent job on it, and uh, did his best to remain true to certain music elements that Bruce himself was partial to, such as percussion and certain things like that, militaristic percussion. Hong Kong in February of The Game of Death was to be a film about so much more than fighting. Those who simply see combat or violence in a Bruce Lee film have usually cheated themselves out of a valuable piece of thought or philosophy that Bruce was willing to share with all who had eyes to see it. These opening shots, incidentally, were from Enter the Dragon. Uh, this is from a uh, behind-the-scenes featurette that was shot. And it shows that uh, the Hong Kong film industry had really uh, picked up, uh, thanks largely to Bruce Lee's efforts uh, throughout from 1971 to 73. This was the first uh, co-production between an American and Chinese uh, film production company. Great shot of Bruce there from Enter the Dragon. And um, this shot here, of course, is from his fight scene with Bob Wall from Enter the Dragon. But it shows just unbelievable hand speed. And at this time, the people in Hong Kong were lining up on, on mass and in droves to come and see Bruce's films, because at the time in Hong Kong, most of the films were uh, unbelievable. And those were Bruce's words, in fact, uh, that they used a lot of wire work, even more than they use today, believe it or not. And, you know, every martial artist was flying through trees and through the air. And one of the things Bruce really wanted to focus on was to bring realism to his movies. And he, that's why his, his fight sequences didn't rely on special effects or the prop department, but rather on uh, the human body and athletic uh, ability and, and up, in some cases up to 20 pages of written instructions. So he was a perfectionist, worked very hard to raise the standard of martial art choreography into a true art form, much like ballet, and he succeeded at that. And Enter the Dragon, this, where this clip is from, was his uh, last completed film. He actually uh, was interrupted while he was making The Game of Death, this film here, uh, to go and make that movie. And, and one of his big goals, of course, was to express his philosophy of bringing people together of different cultures. And uh, a co-production between America and a Chinese film production company really fit the bill. This is uh, some shots from The Game of Death that were taken on the set, the footage of which you'll see finally in its entirety in the last 30 minutes of this film. But he did so many things on this film. He was the choreographer, the director, the producer. Uh, he was actually in charge of uh, not only writing the screenplay and, and the choreography, but also the set design and the lighting of the film. And cinematography. Look at that camera angle. That, shots like this were never really done uh, with different POV shots or point of view shots. Uh, Bruce was quite an adept student of uh, filmmaking. He had a library of perhaps 200 books on it, on the craft. And he'd learned a lot during his time in America to, uh, to learn what sort of production values he really wanted to infuse into the uh, Chinese film industry, and particularly his films. This is an outtake sequence between he and Kareem, which I quite like. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the few times you see them uh, 
actually enjoying themselves on the set. This uh, sequence I included simply because it shows the level of perfection that he brought to a film set. He did 10 takes uh, using this nunchuck, and this sequence only uh, stays on camera for approximately uh, two and a half seconds uh, during the final edit. But he nevertheless did 10 takes until he felt he had it absolutely perfect. The nunchucks that he used, uh, he'd alternate between a wooden pair and a pair made of uh, a polyethylene, which is a plastic. And uh, so sometimes it would, it would break the motor coordination when you're used to twirling wood to suddenly go to a much lighter uh, foam pair. And the foam pair were used primarily for contact. So if you hit somebody, you could actually hit them uh, and therefore add another element of realism to the film. Uh, the gentleman that you just saw in the photo that has now left the screen was Fred Weintraub. He was a fellow who came over on behalf of Warner Brothers to propose the film Enter the Dragon to Bruce while he was shooting The Game of Death. This interview here with Pierre Burton, a Canadian journalist, has significance as well. It was has turned out to be the only surviving on-camera interview of Bruce Lee uh, in existence. It was shot in 1971, December 9th, in Hong Kong, after Bruce's first film, The Big Boss, had rocketed him to stardom in Southeast Asia. And it was also the launching pad for what would prove to be Bruce's international superstardom. This is a shot of Bruce actually attending the um, premiere of his second film, Fist of Fury. And this is his personal copy of the script of Enter the Dragon. Wherever possible in this film, we wanted to use authentic materials from Bruce Lee, uh, whether it was his hand, his own copy of the script or his handwritten choreography notes or daytime diary entries, to sort of put the viewer more in touch with Bruce Lee from his perspective as well, rather than just being a dry uh, narrative of, you know, first he did this and then he did that movie and that. This will give you a better touch of being in touch, in fact, with Bruce Lee. This is Bruce's daytime diary from 1973. Very important, July 20th is the day that he passed away, so these are the last things he wrote prior to his death. And you'll note at the very bottom of this page, dinner with George and Raymond. That uh, uh, George is George Lazenby of James Bond fame, and they had signed him to appear in the game of death the night before. Uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, with Bruce's passing on July 20th, they uh, never lived to realize that to finish the film. And that last entry you saw, uh, about the game of death shows that Bruce had intended to complete that in September. Um, there's been rumors over the past 20 years or so that Bruce had never intended to finish the game of death. If so, two questions come up. One, why so sign George Lazenby? And two, why would you write that in your daytime diary that you intend to complete the film? Here's a perfect example of how movies were before and after Bruce Lee. You know, unbelievable. Uh, techniques and guys flying through the air and silliness and that was the very thing Bruce had sought to combat with his films. He really wanted to add an element of believability. He wanted people to identify with real human beings as the heroes, not supermen or mythic figures uh, which have no grounding in reality. Um, because he knew that if people could see what a human being could do that might inspire them in some way and have a positive impact on their lives. This is an outtake from Enter the Dragon. It was never shown in the uh, final print of the film it was actually a retake of a scene that he shot in his room. This poster um, is from the 1978 release of Game of Death, which purported to have uh, Bruce's footage in it, and of course only used 11 minutes and 7 seconds of what turned out to be 35 minutes. There's no comparison to Lee's original multi-level vision. Without Lee's choreography notes, script outline, and motif, the producers are uncertain what to do with the 100 minutes of footage they have in their possession. Moreover, they discover that Lee was such a perfectionist that of the 100 minutes of footage... This is another series of outtakes between Bruce and his real-life student, Dan Inosanto, using the noon checks. And uh, you can see that Bruce is a perfectionist going over and over these takes until he got it just right, as he did on that shot there. This, of course, is an excerpt from his fight with Kareem. And Bruce was bringing in realistic elements like grappling, kicking, punching. They'd use clips, and if you go back and watch that in slow motion, you'll see uh, that when Bruce jumps back out of the way, it's actually from Kareem's leg, and yet he's fighting Hugh O'Brien, uh, who is not a seven foot two African American NBA player. So, a bit of a distinction there. Even Lee's most zealous fans are beginning to believe that the original footage is gone and that it will never be possible to see the footage Lee shot in its entirety, nor to ever learn what his original storyline for the film was. These were Bruce's script notes for The Game of Death, uh, the storyline. 
Uh, you know, again, another rumor was that Bruce had never written down anything, and therefore the producers had nothing to work with. Not true. Uh, Bruce had taken great pains to write down at least an overview of the film and the scene breakdowns of what he'd intended to film. Uh, after he'd finished filming the uh, finale of the film. This is some choreography notes from Bruce. He would always do sketches first and then write down um, in hand what the techniques would be and then uh, implement them. This is another shot of his scene breakdowns from the film. Uh, you can see landing Hong Kong airport, inside airplane. Uh, so he was pretty well down the track on that. That's a page of choreography writings that Bruce had done between his fight with he and Kareem. And the ones that he's crossed out are the shots that he'd already taken. So it's, it's terrific that uh, Linda, and all credit to her, had preserved these papers over a period of some 28 years. Uh, because when we finally got that raw footage back, those papers served as a blueprint to actually put, the, to edit the film in the sequence and the manner that Bruce had originally intended. So in a way, I was able to lend him my hands uh, to put this film back together and finally at least show you what he had in mind at the time he was filming its finale. You know, undoubtedly that film would have changed because Bruce was always coming up with creative ideas and you know, at that time George Lazenby hadn't come into the picture or other people, so we can only speculate what would have happened had Bruce Lee lived. You'll notice that water is a motif that comes and goes throughout the film because it was uh, a touchstone of Bruce Lee's personal philosophy. It had a certain Taoist uh, influence, certainly, um, but the idea was that, uh, that water flows on, it seeks the path of least resistance, and, uh, and yet it can overcome the hardest, as Bruce is saying here, the hardest objects in the world. Um, it also ties in with yin-yang and uh, Bruce's philosophy of, of taking an active, passive approach to things and not to be, as the Chinese adage says, you know, it is the, uh, the, the firmest branch that breaks first in the wintertime, you know, where the bamboo gives with the wind and the snow and therefore is subtle and survives. That message of adapt and survive or to have the flexibility of mind and body not to be too rigid and thus survive is the touchstone of Bruce's philosophy. He didn't want rigid styles, he didn't want rigid beliefs, he wanted to be able to adapt to life, which is a constant process of change. This screen test was shot for a television series called Number One Son. Uh, the producers had uh, heard of Bruce after he'd given a demonstration in 1964 in a karate tournament of his martial art of Kung Fu. And he came in and did a screen test, and um, they were so impressed with him, they wanted to put him in a television series, which was actually supposed to be about Charlie Chan. Charlie Chan had passed away, and his two sons, one of whom was a ski instructor, uh, I'm not sure which one Bruce would have played, um, was go were going to carry on the sleuthing tradition of Charlie. But that series was never made. Instead, uh, they, they decided to make the Green Hornet television series, and Bruce Lee got the part of Cato, and it was largely due to that screen test that uh, he was awarded that part. These are some home movies, actually, that Bruce had of judo players taken back in the 60s. That fellow on the left is Taki Kimura, Bruce Lee's highest-ranked student and a fellow who is probably his closest friend. We're now back to the screen test, where Bruce is uh, talking about martial art, particularly Kung Fu. And at the time, Kung Fu was unknown in this country. Bruce Lee was really uh, viewed himself as an ambassador of sorts. He wanted to educate American uh, uh, people and, and the American culture about Chinese culture. And he thought that the, uh, the martial heritage was uh, something that was really worth passing on and sharing. Of course, this got him into a lot of trouble later with the Chinese community because they viewed that almost like a religion. It's something that is passed on from father to son, and they're very, very uh, reticent about sharing this information, uh, particularly with foreigners, because they felt that foreigners would ultimately use uh, this information or martial art against them. And uh, China, of course, has had a long history of uh, being dominated or invaded by other countries, and all of their uh, surpluses, such as they are, were you know, being confiscated and, and being subjugated to foreign powers. So it was a very strong feeling that he was up against, but Bruce was very much uh, a product of his times, which was the late 1960s, and he believed in equality for all people and that we should look beyond the confines of race and nationality and ethnic background, and if you had an interest in something, you as an individual should be free to pursue it. So he practiced Kung Fu religiously and was willing to teach it to anyone, regardless of race, color, or creed, who had an interest in it. And um, this brought him into serious conflict with the Chinese community.
deeply into the matter to penetrate through to the ultimate truth. I think we're going to cut away here in a minute to some sketches that Bruce did on Gung Fu. This would have been back in 1962, 63. But it shows that this, you know, this was probably done even while, uh, uh, perhaps even while he was at school, because it's in a school notebook. But his mind was forever on developing and perfecting this art and thinking of new ways to teach it. We saw earlier, too, a page from his philosophy notebook. That was Bruce's major in college. He was a philosophy major. And uh, that interest would stay with him throughout his life. Bruce, uh, this little passage here is very, very interesting because Bruce is talking about sort of the popular approach where in, in America, particularly, they, uh, they teach you to be admired by your friends and feared by your enemies if you enroll in so-and-so's deadly martial art course. And he was saying that, you know, so much of these martial arts are bound up with uh, complicated moves and, and sort of gimmicks for the most part. And really what you needed to focus on was being simple and direct. Like he says here, just directly express it, boom, one move. Or st stamp on the guy's instep. Uh, if a guy's grabbed, you don't have to do a bunch of intricate hand movements in order to make him release his grip. And that was the essence of it, is, you know, more realism. Here's Bruce uh, performing an uh, uh, exercise from... Gung Fu called Chi Sao, which is sticking hands or rolling hands. It's really an energy drill where you feel the opponent's forward energy coming in and try and deflect it and then find an opening and attack. Uh, Taki Kimura was the gentleman who Bruce was doing Chi Sao with in that clip, and this is Taki today. Uh, terrific individual and uh, one who really grasps the full meaning of Bruce's philosophy, as you would expect being his highest ranked student. He was also the best man at Bruce's wedding and uh, one of the true decent human beings uh, you would encounter. Um, this is Bruce's, one of his early Seattle classes. The gentleman on the left is uh, Jesse Glover, who was actually Bruce's first student in America, first private student. And uh, he's written a book as well about Bruce, which is quite in informative. Taki uh, knew Bruce from when Bruce was doing Gung Fu right through to the end uh, of Bruce's life. So he was there for the evolution of Bruce from uh, you know, a humble martial artist in a basement in Seattle to, uh, you know, world superstar in the creation of Lee's Art of Jeet Kune Do. This is Linda Lee Cadwell, Bruce's widow and wife of nine years, uh, a terrific lady who uh, we have all to thank for actually this film because were it not for her preservation of materials, we would not be able to um, share with you Bruce's vision for the film. And she was also a collaborator in many ways. She worked with Bruce. Bruce would work out, on, you know, he'd get an idea for a martial arts technique that would look good on camera and that might be effective. And since no one else was around at 10 o'clock at night, you know, poor Linda would be the one that he'd, he'd demonstrate it on to see if it worked. She also was, uh, it's interesting, if you look through the Game of Death notes that Bruce took, uh, in some instances, you can see Linda's handwriting, because Bruce would get an idea, and I guess Linda would be the closest one to a pad of paper, and she'd quickly grab it and jot it down. And, uh, she was very much a collaborator in many ways, and uh, their relationship is another perfect example of yin and yang, or yin-yang, because there is no distinction between the two. And uh, she was very, very uh, calming and helpful to Bruce Lee, and indeed, were it not for Linda, he may not have uh, had the latitude to develop himself as a martial artist and filmmaker that he did. That was a shot from Bruce's first school in uh, uh, Chinatown in Los Angeles. And this was a notebook which he kept on his uh, Do or Dao or way of Gung Fu. This is an interesting clip <clears throat> because a lot of martial artists today talk about how they won all of these karate tournaments back in the 60s and, and how you know, tough they were. And, and they also, also try to use that to say that Bruce never competed in tournaments, so you'll never know how good he really was. Well, here's an example of a demonstration of, uh, of those arts back in that era when Bruce was competing. You can see that these are pretty much prearranged self-defense demonstrations. And uh, not particularly, you know, no one's going to stand there. Watch this guy throws a punch and then crouches and goes away. And this is a, from a tournament. These are the type of non-contact karate tournaments that existed that many of these world champions later went on to hold up as examples of their awesome fighting skills. Now, you'll note that there's very little, if any, contact made, and that was the point. Judges would uh, determine whether or not a blow could have landed and done damage, and um, that was how a winner was decided. There were, from time to time, injuries. There's Bruce looking uh, not too uh, enthused by the whole thing. Uh, that uh, There were instances where, where contact would be made, but it was always by accident, and the person who made contact was penalized for lack of control. And Bruce just thought that was a joke. Um, it had nothing to do with real fighting, which was his interest. This is some home movie footage uh, that Bruce had in his possession. 
uh, of a rooftop fight in Hong Kong. Bruce is not in this uh, fight, but uh, it is a demonstration of the sort of real, I mean, this is, this is contact being made here, so it's not, uh, no, no referees are saying, oh, don't, uh, don't hit, or he could have killed him if he wanted to. This is the real thing. And that was his background. He engaged in many of those rooftop fights himself. So when he came to America, uh, he was stunned to see that the people were getting all these accolades for not hitting people in a real fight. He didn't quite understand that and thought it might be a dangerous practice to hand off to students uh, techniques which really had not been tried and tested in actual self-defense situations. These are books from Bruce's library. This is a book on boxing by an author by the name of Hazlitt, who Bruce was profoundly influenced by. He found a lot of truth in Western boxing, and it really caused him to reevaluate the whole uh, classical uh, martial arts system as it came from China, because he felt that a lot of it, um, while it had originally been invented for combat, it had sort of focused more on the art side of it as opposed to the actual uh, fighting side of it. And he wanted to get, as Kareem will say in a little bit, right back to the essence of it. He was the first one to don boxing gloves, body protectors, and have his students fight all out uh, because he thought that taught them. You know, it'll, it'll, if you get hit, uh, at least you won't get hurt quite so badly. Um, but it would teach you, you know, to keep your guard up in one case or what you can and can't do in a real combative situation. That fellow that Bruce just punched there is Sammo Hung, uh, who would later go on to uh, fame in America as the star of martial law. Here's Bruce in 1967 demonstrating full contact sparring. This had never been seen in the martial art world prior to this. And um, again, a lot of uh, martial artists, particularly karate men, have uh, said, oh, Bruce never fought in tournaments. But you've seen the type of fighting that was done in those tournaments. You know, Bruce was doing full contact, this sort of thing, while they were doing point system and pulling their techniques. Here's a perfect example of interception. Boom. Hits Bob Wall while Bob was coming in to do a kick. Bruce intercepted it with a kick of his own. A very uh, methodical man, Bruce. These are notes that he wrote on, on the mechanics. This actually were some sketches he was doing for an idea for a book on his art. Uh, but he called his art Jeet Kune Do, which uh, is Cantonese for the way of the intercepting fist. Do is the Cantonese way of saying Dao or way. Uh, this is a clip from the television series Long Street, um, where Bruce actually got to um, co-write this episode. And it was entitled, appropriately enough, The Way of the Intercepting Fist, or Jeet Kune Do. Here he is demonstrating the principle of interception on uh, one of the characters in the film, guy, character by the name of Duke. And uh, Bruce explains the subtleties of uh, his martial approach. My longest weapon, my sidekick, against the nearest target, your kneecap. This can be As he said, it can be compared to your left jab in boxing, but it's more damaging. And he knew a lot about boxing. He had over you know, 500 films in his collection of boxers, which he used to watch through a little editor, which was a hand reel type thing. You'd run it through and you could watch it frame by frame. This is actually a, from a private lesson with a student by the name of James Coburn, who most people know is an Academy Award winner. They were uh, to collaborate on a film called The Silent Flute, which was based on an idea that Bruce had created and written. And Coburn was going to play the lead, and Bruce was going to play five separate roles. Uh, sadly, the film ne was never made. And it may well have been above the heads of most people at, the, at that uh, time, because it was heavily philosophical about the higher purpose of martial art and how you have to turn those tools or weapons inward and use it to defeat your own hang-ups or insecurities rather than simply dominating an opponent. It was a pretty profound piece. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, of course, was uh, Bruce's private student. And uh, Bruce really enjoyed the uh, challenge that his height differential provided. And Kareem's seven foot two. Bruce was about five, seven and a half. And uh, he learned certain things, like he told his student Taki Kimura that Chi Sao, that sticking exercise that you saw, was completely ineffective against a guy with Kareem because his arms are so long. You could, you could find an opening, but you couldn't reach him. So it also caused Bruce to reevaluate his art in, in different ways as well, because he recognized that your opponent is not always going to cooperate, and he's not always going to be your size. So you have to be able to adapt to the unexpected. This is an interesting article, it appeared in the Sport Week section of the Washington Star, where an independent third-party journalist wrote about how Bruce taught his students. These are from, uh, excerpts from Bruce's own daytime diary showing how he taught these people martial art. That's Joe Lewis, who is uh, one of the top karate fighter, if not the top karate fighter in North America uh, during this era. He won so many karate tournaments and actually went on to do exceptionally well in full contact karate, which was... Uh, terrific. He was one of the few guys who uh, was a point martial artist who uh, took it further and, and saw the fact that uh, point karate was not uh, 
was not real fighting. Uh, another student of Bruce's was Chuck Norris. Chuck wasn't uh, a full-time student or anything like that, but he did study with Bruce privately on at least seven occasions, and uh, Bruce taught him martial art. And um, it's interesting to hear Bruce Lee reading, as he is right now, that Washington Star article, because it confirms uh, that these people did come to him for instruction. And um, you know, he must have been, it just it is a testament to Bruce's greatness, I think, again, as a martial artist, that people, martial artists who are already well-established, champions, world champions, in fact, uh, would seek out the counsel of a 5'7", 130-pound Chinese-American martial artist. Um, he must have been as good as they say. Here's a clip of Bruce and James Coburn, and actually it's my belief that this was choreography uh, practice for the silent flute, uh, because the posture that Bruce assumed there was not his. That was, he had different characters, rhythm man, monkey man, all these things, and, and they were a little more traditional than Bruce was. So here's Bruce at a tournament by Grandmaster Jun Ri, who uh, has been called the uh, father of American Taekwondo. He introduced it. Uh, and popularized it, certainly, during the late 60s. And uh, we're making the point here that if Bruce, at the very height of his popularity, if he was just interested in making money because of his success as the Green Hornet being Cato, and he had a good profile in the magazines and a good following in Hollywood, he could have made a lot of money uh, by opening a chain of schools. And instead, he took the other approach. He closed his schools because he was beginning to recognize that people were coming to him thinking he had a magic system, you know, show me these magic techniques. And it was never techniques that were the key to Bruce, it was the individual. It's how hard you work, how much work you put into it. For example, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard could teach you a terrific left jab, but if you don't go and practice, you know, the hell out of that left jab, you're never going to achieve any sense of mastery of it. And that was how Bruce achieved mastery, was by his own diligent practice. And he tried to inculcate in his students um, a willingness and a belief in themselves to, to essentially train themselves. I often say that he, he operated on the principle of the physician rather than the clergyman. You know, the, the clergyman will typically want to bring more people into the fold and, and, um, and prove the veracity of his creed simply by the amount of people there. And Bruce's concept was to get rid of his students, to make them well enough that they didn't even need him as an instructor. So he really preferred to work one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't believe it was a mass art. He believed that you have to get in touch with yourself, find out what your strengths and weaknesses are, and try the best you can to, to overcome your weaknesses and to enhance your strengths. But that's something that no one else can give to you any more than they can eat your food for you and get your nutrition from it. You have to do it yourself. And that was the premise, actually, of this episode of Longstreet, that he was teaching James Franciscus, Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fist, which... You know, he later defined martial art as the art of expressing the human body, which is a pretty good definition. And now he's about to go into his famous water soliloquy, uh, where he talks about the need to be formless, not to go into a fight or to anything in life with a rigid set plan, but to be formless and to adapt to whatever besets you. Because if you're, if you're rigid, you'll break. If you bend, you'll survive. Or crash. Be water, my friend. Yeah. He's actually grooming Franciscus for a fight that uh, Longstreet is supposed to have with uh, a longshoreman. But uh, as he tells him, he's not ready at this point. He hasn't spent enough time there. And um, he's still too worried about what will happen. He's, too, he's still too self-conscious. And this is another theme that comes back in the game of death, the art of dying. It's really what that means, essentially, is losing your sense of self. If you go into a fight worried that, oh, if I do this, he could hit me, and geez, he's a big guy, and that could really you know, do some damage, you've already lost. The idea is you have to lose that sense of self, basically die to all your fears, so that whatever you do, you're just reacting to the moment. You're not in there you know, being terrified or reacting to thoughts or abstractions, but dealing with the reality of an ever-changing present in the art of combat. And that's what Kareem's saying, too. He said, you know, he was going to take judo, but Bruce said, you know, imagine you trying to get your hips beneath a guy like me at 5'7". You think I'm just going to stand there and let you do it? And this is Bruce training uh, on his own in his backyard with a heavy bag, really rocking that. And what's interesting is a student of Bruce's by the name of Ted Wong told me that this was after Bruce had injured his back. And uh, still, look at the, uh, what he was doing. And look at this, one-finger push-ups on one hand. 
elevated V sets. Uh, I mean, his his physical conditioning was amazing. This is the one inch punch that Bruce is renowned for. Holding his hand only an inch away, boom, generates that much power to topple a man. But uh, he knew body mechanics, just like the sidekick. Look how far he, I mean, there's no wire work in that. This was actual uh, impact. And people that I spoke to, one gentleman who, who held that pad that that guy held, it's actually called an air shield, um, said it was like being hit by a car when Bruce Lee kicked you. And, and he knew what he spoke of because this man had been hit by a car, in fact. Uh, Bruce was one of the first martial artists to incorporate weight training into his regimen. Uh, this was not done commonly in the 60s because there was a popular myth that weights would make you muscle bound and slow you down. And uh, Bruce, you know, read physiology textbooks and, and read uh, the literature on it and realized that it was simply progressive resistance exercise. And you can use the principle of progressive resistance even in cardiovascular training, you know, by, by doing, covering more ground in a shorter amount of time, adding distance, making your workouts progressive. And he recognized that the stronger he made his engine, the more efficient his engine would be, and the engine were the, was the muscles of his body. This is a shot of Bruce taken, oh, about 1965, and uh, shows a small portion of his library, which was tremendous. And the book in his hand is called The Source Book of Chinese Philosophy. Bruce didn't just read about fighting and training. He was, he was uh, very interested in philosophy, and literature, and the arts. And uh, this is a passage or a section from his martial art uh, book component. Uh, there's some boxing books. That one called Boxing with the Gray and the or Brown is actually the one from Hazlet that we opened and scanned earlier. Um, but he had this tremendous book. And after his back injury, uh, he, he channeled his what would have been his physical energy into more mental uh, activity. He, he thought more about his martial art, and he recognized that having created a way, the way of the intercepting fist, um, he, had, he had created a box, essentially, and the people could, uh, his students were learning a way, a set way of doing things, a principle, uh, an art predicated on the principle of interception. And uh, while it was efficient, he also recognized that you can't, you know, again, you're limiting people. If you, if you say you can only intercept them, um, you're handicapping them. So his idea was to get rid of ways, get rid of styles, and just freely adapt, freeform, uh, to, to the moment. This is Jiddu Krishnamurti. He was a, a philosopher, a fellow who was actually groomed to be the new world teacher or messiah, and he rejected it in uh, the early 1920s in Holland. He had a, a following called the Order of the Star, had uh, over 30,000 uh, adherents, and he dissolved the order, saying, you know, man does not come to truth by gurus or leaders. He has to find it within himself. He said, truth is a pathless land. And that had a profound effect upon Bruce Lee at this time, because he was coming to those views himself uh, with regard to martial art. He saw, as Krishnamurti did in spiritual issues, he saw the same problems in martial arts, that people were looking to their instructors or their styles as providing the truth, and they were content simply to follow them. And he said, you must seek out your own truth. Um, so he saw a lot of merit in Krishnamurti and saw a, uh, an application uh, in the realm of martial art and made that application. Moreover, as he once said, you know, willing is not enough, we must apply. Knowing is not enough, we must do. It was a great shot from Enter the Dragon uh, of uh, Bruce being very much the individual. Here's some more sketches that Bruce did. Uh, that's from his private notes on, on martial art. We're back to a clip from Longstreet where he's teaching James Franciscus again to be more freeform, to not be just to listen to the music which Bruce was actually playing in this clip and, and, to, and to relate to it. This is a, a paper, some papers of Bruce and we see how he went from a Chinese martial artist to into martial artist of full contact based on uh, Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fist, to finally an individual who ceased to see himself uh, defined by those terms. He saw himself simply as a human being and human beings had all sorts of movement potential and different options available to them instead of fitting into a classical form or mold as Bruce called it in the Chinese way or or even the way of the intercepting fist. He was really at this point interested in the individual and having the individual express himself rather than being locked into anyone else's doctrines or teachings. And he makes this point quite eloquently here, I think, to Pierre Burton. Doctrines, and then the doctrine became the gospel truth, you know, that you cannot change, you know. And 
But if you do not have styles, if you just say, well, here, here I am, you know, as, as a human being, how can I express myself? Actually, this component is probably uh, best described by Bruce and by Linda, because she was there when Bruce, you know, when the genesis of this viewpoint uh, came to him. So I'm going to shut up for a moment. That person's movement so that there's no set pattern of movements, no, well, when he does this, then I do this. It's just a total freedom to react to what the other person does. In fact, Bruce inscribes it perfectly on the back of this medallion. I'll interrupt Linda here just to say that uh, that medallion that she has on her neck is the actual one that Bruce wore. This is it here. On the back of it, it is written, using no way as way, having no limitation as limitation. On the flip side of it is the yin-yang emblem with two arrows around it, which showed that uh, you know anything that goes to extremes becomes the other. And um, also, he had the Chinese characters, yi mo fat, wai yao fat, yi mo han, wai yao han, which is Cantonese for using no way as way and having no limitation as limitation. And you can see in martial arts, people are taught to do the same thing, like robots. One after, everyone moves the same way, everybody dresses the same way. And, uh, and of course, history is replete with examples of how that can lead to disaster. You know, you just, if you cease to think for yourself, there's a medallion again that Bruce is actually wearing. Um, then you can be easily led by people to evil. I think there's even a biblical passage to that, that thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. And uh, it's very easy to be led to do evil if you don't think for yourself and have your own standards of, of uh, correct judgment. Be cocky yeah. and be flooded with a cocky feeling and then yeah. feel like pretty cool and all that. Or I can f make all kinds of phony things, you see what I mean? Blinded by it. Or I can show you some... Here Bruce is again talking about the, the difference between self-image actualization or moving to impress and self-actualization, which is you know, moving with purpose and your purpose, which is the most important thing. And you know, the students I think that were closest to him, such as Kareem and guys like Ted Wong and uh, Danny Inasato and uh, Taki Kimura, they they got the point, you know, they got the message of it. You know, this was not uh, a sausage factory where you went in one end and got the same education as everyone else and all came out the same on the other end. That wasn't the idea. The idea was to come out as yourself. You might come in as a lost soul, but hopefully you'd find yourself through training. It was sort of a form of martial therapy, actually, where you would, uh, instead of weight training, which just sort of works the physical or or uh, you know psychoanalysis, which concentrates on the psychological. The idea was that you know body and mind are, are an integrated unit, and martial art was a way to get you in touch with that. And Bruce was very very um, aware of that. In fact, was an embodiment of it. This is another clip from Longstreet, where uh, Longstreet uh, makes a statement here uh, that uh, he was willing to empty his cup in order to taste Bruce's tea which harkens back to an old Zen story of a, a fellow that uh, was a, a professor and went to visit a Zen master and, uh, to ask him about Zen. And during the course of the conversation, as you asked him, the Zen master replied, uh, this fellow would keep interrupting him, saying, yeah, well, we have that in the West, too. You know, we do that sort of thing, and yes, we have that. And finally, the Zen master started to pour tea into a cup for this fellow, and he kept pouring and pouring until it overflowed. And the guy said, what are you doing? You know, stop that. No more can go into the cup. And the Zen master said, indeed. And your mind is very much like that cup. And unless you first empty your mind or your cup, how can you taste my cup of tea? And it was an adage that Bruce uh, meant a lot to him. In fact, he included it in an essay that he wrote about his art of Jeet Kune Do and the need uh, to keep an empty cup. As he once said, the usefulness of a cup is in its emptiness rather than teaching martial arts on a mass basis. And so he tried to pursue... Linda's commenting here on the fact that uh, there was a difficult time for Bruce in Hollywood. This is a clip from Marlowe, which he did with James Garner. Uh, tremendous scene here. But it was difficult in Hollywood for a young Asian male to get a leading role. Hollywood just said, there's the, you know, it's unbankable. We can't put money in that. And it was unfortunate that despite Bruce's talent, this incredible talent, and again, this uh, great intellect, I think, in many respects, he was a very intelligent man, uh, Hollywood just said, no, there's no market for that. You know, the silent flute project was uh, shelved, um, not because Bruce was Chinese, but simply because James Coburn had pulled out of it, and Warner Brothers, the, who was going to do it at the time, 
said without a bankable star like James Coburn, uh, you know, we're not going to get our money back on it. So they withdrew support. And it was, it was quite a devastating blow to Bruce because he had an awful lot riding on that. You have to realize that at this time, Bruce had two children to support, a wife. He had a mortgage on a house, like most people do. And uh, he had hurt his back, so he wasn't able to teach martial art uh, quite as frequently or as actively as before. And he also decided that ethically he couldn't teach it that way. He just felt that wasn't correct. So he was really banking on using the medium of film to teach this message of personal liberation. And, you know, it's a tough sell. <laughs> it's a tough sell at any time, but uh, particularly in Hollywood, you know, where they want car chases and explosions and things like that uh, to teach a philosophical lesson. There's not much market for it. And when it's coming from a young Asian male, uh, there's even less of a market for it because in Hollywood during this time, um, you know, Asians were looked upon primarily as props for scenes. I mean, uh, most of us would recall episodes of television series like Bonanza where these people were just, you know, any Asian was in the background. It was, it was terrible. But uh, Bruce really single-handedly obliterated that stereotype. And uh, I think the, the preponderance now of, uh, of uh, Asian uh, talent that has come into Hollywood, whether it be Ang Lee in directing or Jackie Chan or Sammo Hung or Stanley Tong or these other people, really have Bruce Lee to thank for not only opening the door for them, but creating the door where there was no door before. He was Chinese was not considered a bankable commodity. Let me ask you. The interesting thing about this interview here with Pierre Burton was that Bruce, just the day before, received the cable that he had been passed over for the lead of Kung Fu because he was too Chinese, essentially. So the wound was still deep uh, with Bruce, and yet I think he handles it with uh, not only good naturedly, but with. Uh, uh, certainly more understanding than most people would. You'd think he would be quite bitter, but uh, like he said, he understands that in certain parts of the country, uh, people don't want to see an Asian leading man, and it's unfortunate, but you know, what can you do? If, like he said, you know, the guys that are holding the money are the ones that make the decision, and they thought it was a risk, too big a risk to uh, take a chance with an Asian male. And he's saying, you know, probably it's the same in this country if someone came over and was making films uh, or wanted to to make a film, the the acceptance might not be there from the Chinese audience, and that was something that he really tried to infuse in his films. You know, he didn't want uh, uh, you know racial barriers or distinctions. Uh, he, he just thought it should an idea should stand or fall on its own merit. Here's a shot, uh, typically of how Asians were portrayed in Hollywood at, at this time. And Bruce, even though he desperately needed the money, I mean, he needed to support his family. Uh, refused these roles when they were offered to him because he wouldn't accept anything that was demeaning to the Chinese race or more broadly that would show any race of human beings being inferior uh, to another race. So he decided to take his chances in Hong Kong. In 1971 he went there to make a movie uh, called The Big Boss and that was shot actually in Thailand but uh, he got paid very little money for it and uh, the film broke box office records not simply because he was you know a Chinese uh, fellow doing a, a film for a Chinese audience, but because there was something beyond that, that that reached out from that. There was a realism, there was a human quality that was present in a Bruce Lee film, which was not present in other ones, where the acting was stiff, uh, you know, caricatured for the most part, and then all these fantasy fight scenes of people on wires and flying through the air. He wanted human beings to relate as human beings to what he was presenting them. And I think it was that brand of action that he brought, or as he said, you know, he was being himself, Bruce Lee, just honestly expressing himself, that uh, resulted in those films, and that film particularly, being so successful. What he was doing. At the time, at the time, most of the Chinese films were swordplay films, and you can see how unbelievable these are as well. I mean, flying through the air, doing a leap, and then when you're falling, you turn sideways and keep that sword going. You know? I mean, how believable is that? But that's what he was up against, and uh, he just thought, you know, this is so far out and so unbelievable that if people get a dose of what martial art is really about and how it can really be presented in an artistic form, that uh, I think they're going to find it very significant and it's going to make a difference. And as he says here, he, you know, he didn't want violence just for the sake of violence. There had to be a just cause for it. Um, he was very conscious, probably because of his philosophy training, that he was also... Uh, even subconsciously imparting certain moral lessons to uh, to his audience and therefore he didn't believe that if you went around killing people in a film that you should uh, get off scot-free I mean you should be punished for it and, and that there were 
um, there were laws that needed to be obeyed. In fact, at the end of this film, the big boss, because he's had to take the lives of many people, his character is arrested. And at the end of his next film, Fist of Fury, uh, his character is actually shot uh, by a firing squad, essentially, for taking the lives of people. But he insisted on that because, you know, you, that's to go around killing people is <laughs> it's not something that should be extolled. Uh, but he really wanted to, uh, to teach philosophy as well as uh, some of the higher purposes of martial art in his films. Who had a mission that really had nothing to do with what his nationality was. He wanted to bring his views of martial arts and of life and of the culture that he had experienced in his short lifetime to the audiences. One of the more interesting elements, too, is that his first two films, he sought to redress the imbalance that existed even in the Chinese film community. In Hong Kong, which had been uh, dominated by the Japanese and then later the British, um, Bruce Lee recognized that the Chinese, many of them, felt themselves to be subservient or a second-class citizen in their own country. So he wanted to do films that would redress that balance. And his first two films strongly showed um, Chinese patriotism in some respect, that they were as good as any other foreign power. Um, but he didn't believe they were better, he just believed all human beings were the same. And in this film with Chuck Norris, he not only makes a, a display of Jeet Kune Do, which is to adapt and be freeform rather than rigid and set, but in this scene here, which he specifically wrote in, he shows respect to a foreigner. And this, remember, was shown uh, to a Chinese audience. This was never done before in film. And the idea was, this is a human being I'm fighting here. This isn't just a, you know, a guaylo or a white devil or a foreigner. This is, and uh, as a human being, we have to, you know, recognize our commonality. Uh, it was a bit of a test for Bruce because he, he wanted to do more and more philosophical films, but he wanted to, you know, get his audience with him, of course. So that was a real test to see whether or not uh, the audience would accept his philosophy. And they did, overwhelmingly which is what led to this film, Enter the Dragon, <clears throat> and another lesson that he teaches about the higher purpose of martial art, which, as he believed, was to avoid fighting, or to use your brain to avoid fighting. Don't use your fists, you know, use your mind. And uh, it was actually based on an old uh, television program that he'd seen in the 60s and recorded on reel-to-reel -reel audio tape by Alan Watts, the uh, famous uh, Westerner who popularized Eastern philosophy, particularly Zen in this country where Watts related a story of Daizet Suzuki's, of the uh, samurai, Musashi, who was challenged on a ferry boat and, uh, by another samurai, and they agreed to go to the island, and Musashi said that he was from the no-sword school of fencing, and that uh, this guy wanted to have a demonstration of this no-sword school, and when they w agreed to take a little boat to an island, and when they got to the uh, island, or got close enough that they could walk onto the beach, this young, eager samurai jumped off the boat, drew his sword, and Musashi told the uh, ferryman to push the boat out from the shore and left him stranded there. That was the art of fighting without fighting. Uh, and Bruce liked that idea, <clears throat> and he thought there was a direct application in unarmed combat as well. And um, he once said that the tools in the, of the martial artist in the highest stage are not directed outward, but directed inward. And um, Here's a perfect example of using your mind to win a fight or to dominate an opponent rather than having to physically dominate him. And uh, Bruce wrote that scene himself for the film. The dragon, Lee is now ready to complete the film that will embody his greatest message, a film Lee calls The Game of Death. I believe that this background of research and the building of a philosophy of Well, now we're into the game of death section. He was just come off the way of the dragon. The audience was receptive to his philosophy. So, as he said, he was going to, he wanted to make multi-level films where you could just watch the action if you wanted to. But if you wanted to look a little deeper, there'd be something there for you as well. And uh, he was going to teach lessons in this film, not only in martial arts such as, you know, the uh, principle of bend and survive or to be formless you know, sort of the free-form martial artist of no style, but also the art of dying. That was another lesson that he taught there. And, and when you get to the section in the actual footage where he's speaking to Kareem, uh, that's the lesson that they're talking about. We do know with unimpeachable certainty... Bruce showing how he adapts to a fellow who's bigger, you bring him down to your level. You don't try and fight him at his level. This is the cover page from Bruce's Game of Death uh, script notes. 
And uh, this was uh, part of a storyline. You'll see this on the DVD where we have uh, we enacted the storyline of his 12-page uh, script. Um, but that's the actual temple that he'd envisioned going in Korea. It's a village called Popchusa in South Korea. It's about three hours south of Seoul. Um, and that is the, was the oldest freestanding uh, wooden pagoda in uh, believed in Southeast Asia. And according to Bruce's storyline, there was a team of martial artists that had been recruited by a, a bad fellow, this gentleman here, the boss, who wanted them to take part in a raid on this pagoda. Uh, in the pagoda, so the early treatment of the story went, there would be a treasure that uh, they were supposed to take. And they apparently the boss had hired another mercenary team prior to, uh, to this, which had failed. And uh, he wanted Bruce because his character, um, the fellow who got the furthest last time, had been a student of Bruce's. So he figured, you know, where the student fails, the master will succeed. So he coerces him into taking part on this raid. These are Bruce's actual sketches of this village, which he did from photographs. He had a friend go to Korea and take some pictures, which Bruce worked off uh, for the set. This is a shot looking at uh, the different floors of the pagoda. It's a, what's interesting with the pagoda is in real life it's actually a facade. It's only one floor inside, um, one great big room, whereas in Bruce's concept it was many stories. This was uh, a note he had uh, showing the breakdowns of uh, the scene, how many days he'd be filming each scene. and. Um, he liked the pagoda, and I don't think it's an accident that uh, it was in a Buddhist village because there is, that, of course, that Buddhist um, ethos that runs through a lot of Bruce's philosophy of uh, the respect for all living things, irrespective of uh, nationality or ethnic uh, belief, that you must have that respect for all fellow creatures. And that was very much part of Bruce's uh, philosophy. Bruce, we do several things in, in a split second, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the Kareem's explaining um, part of the attraction of uh, uh, the two of them working together on the film. You know, they, they'd worked together and talked about making a film together ever since Bruce was a student of, uh, or Kareem was a student of Bruce's back in 67. So uh, this had finally come true. And they're excited. Look at Bruce's forearm in that shot. I mean, there's a guy who uh, took his forearm training quite seriously. James Chen was a popular uh, Hong Kong actor who was actually. Uh, groomed to be the next superstar in Hong Kong. Uh, he was in the film, Bruce's first film, The Big Boss, but once the director saw Bruce's charisma, this uh, poor James Chen was always relegated to uh, support status thereafter. This gentleman is Che Yun, the fellow in the black uh, martial arts outfit. Sadly, he passed away about a year or so after Bruce did. Um, so uh, we never got to see much more work from him. He was a stuntman in Hong Kong at the time. And Bruce's first choice for the role that uh, Che Yoon got was actually Sammo Hung. But uh, Sammo, I believe, was unavailable, so he uh, settled on Che Yoon. Bruce's early script notes indicate that it was Sammo who was going to play that role. Here we're looking at the various levels of the pagoda and which martial artists would uh, guard which level. This gentleman, Wang Yin Sik, was to have guard the, guarded the first floor of the pagoda, and he was going to be a master, in Bruce's uh, words, of a kicking style. Uh, what style that was, perhaps Taekwondo, uh, we're not sure. Uh, Bruce didn't specialize, but that was going to be the idea. Praying Mantis uh, Gong Fu was going to be the second uh, level, and he was going to ask Taki to do that. Here they're demonstrating some uh, trapping from Wing Chun. Uh, the Chinese uh, uh, self-defense system from uh, southern China, I think it originated in. And uh, he wanted Taki to come to town, actually sent him an airline ticket to do it. And of course, Taki was uh, reticent because he, uh, he'd never been on camera before. He was scared to death to do it. But uh, he knew, you know, Bruce was the master in terms of, uh, you know, choreography. And Bruce made all of, and anyone who appeared in his films look good because he, he took it that seriously and really did raise it to the level of art. The Taki uh, agreed to do it, although he was petrified, of course. And unfortunately, in the final analysis, um, Bruce died before Taki could get there, so he never lived to uh, film that sequence. But that was Bruce's hope, was to have uh, Taki as the praying mantis instructor. And he would have been good, too. I think he had transcended the, all the gimmicks that, you know, that, that are usually in these movies. And, and I think that he had, he had gotten to that plateau where you could just simply do the simple, you know, normal things and yet create that excitement within that simplicity. The third level here uh, was to be guarded by Dan Inosanto. 
who uh, is a tremendous martial artist in his own right. He uh, not only was a student of Bruce's art, of uh, Jeet Kune Do, in fact it was the Jung Fan method, so-called, it was actually a system then when Dan first started training with Bruce, but uh, he's also a fellow who's uh, studied so many martial arts, I mean he has encyclopedic knowledge of the arts, and uh, here he is uh, using the Nunchuk uh, with Bruce, or the Nunchaku as it's also called was originally a uh, rice flail in Okinawa until the Japanese soldiers confiscated the uh, the peasantry's weapons and they had to resort on their own farm implements to, for self-defense. But, uh, and this is uh, Chian Jie, a, uh, at the time, a seventh degree Hapkido master. Since, uh, since then now, of course, he's a grandmaster. And uh, he represented uh, joint locking and uh, it's, it's pretty eclectic actually. Uh, Hapkido, so there's, but it's a, it's a relatively recent art. I think it started in the 40s as it compared to some of the more traditional arts like, uh, you know, praying mantis kung fu, which goes back many hundred years. Um, Chian Jie was uh, uh, a fellow that uh, Bruce met, as he says, at Andrews Air Force Base during a, a, a martial arts tournament that was held by Jun Ri. If you recall the black and white footage we showed earlier from these various tournaments, one of them was from a Jun Ri tournament. Uh, but Bruce was, you know, knew all about all sorts of different martial arts, and he really liked to learn about other martial arts and martial artists to read their playbook, basically, to know what he might have to encounter if he fought these people. Um, but um, he, he really wanted this to be a showcase of athleticism, martial arts, and philosophy. And Kareem, at the highest level, represents the man of no style. He and Bruce are sort of the two JKD or Jeet Kune Do practitioners. You notice Bruce is not wearing a traditional outfit, martial art outfit, neither is Kareem. So sometimes if you look at a martial artist, you can guess kind of what you're going to be in or up against, in for or up against, because of a style. If it's a judo gi, you know he's going to try and grab you and throw you. Um, you know, if it's karate, it might be a, a, a kick or a, or a strike of some sort. But uh, when a guy's seven foot two and just wearing a pair of shorts, uh, you know, who knows what it's going to be. And this was the moment in the film where Bruce pokes holes in the uh, windows or the panes, or the, the uh, paper panes, to let light in because he's discovered that Kareem is light sensitive and that tips a scale to Bruce's advantage in a fight, which again shows his principle of being able to adapt. You know, they don't teach you how to break windows in martial arts schools. Uh, you have to be able to adapt to what's in front of you. Look at that, almost a perfect split to uh, kick uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the head. Um, just amazing uh, athleticism fight a person of a different style, a very precise style, on each floor of the pagoda and show how he could fit in with anybody else's style, thus having no style of his own. It's the green bamboo whip, which to Bruce represented flexibility, again, like water, to be able to adapt. He, um, he again, there's a lot of symbolism in this film, from the outfit to the whip, um, to teach the audience a lesson. So it's not just going out there and hitting a guy with a stick. This uh, whip is symbolic of something, and it's part of his martial art belief. Same with the yellow tracksuit. Um, you know, most martial artists wear you know belts or uh, gis, as they call them. You know, their, their karate outfits or whatever. And Bruce is wearing a tracksuit. This is this is modern. He's not. It's the first film he was in where he wasn't wearing a traditional Chinese kung fu outfit, because he's not playing a role of a Chinese martial artist. He's not wearing the kung fu slippers, he's, he's playing the role of a human being who is honestly expressing himself in the art of combat. And, uh, you know, when Bruce worked out, he wore track suits, you know, he wore uh, running shoes, and that's what he's got on here. And, uh, again, it's, it's an individual thing, it's not a, not a mass thing, not, a, not an institutionalized activity. It's the ability of the individual to adapt to changing circumstances. And here's some more sketches that he did uh, for his choreography. This was with the Chian Jie fight, where he picks him up and breaks his back. And some more handwritten elements from the Kareem fight. And uh, this was an outtake that wasn't, uh, wasn't used in the final film. You can see him, he do take after take. And the only reason I included these outtakes in the film is to show you the level of work that he brought to it. He took it very seriously. In a Bruce Lee movie, you don't see outtakes. It's not like a Jackie Chan film, where at the end you see a bunch of outtakes and flubs and it's ha ha ha, we had a great time doing it. To Bruce, he wasn't, that wasn't what he was interested in. He was interested in showing you the best that he could give you. And um, that's why there, you don't see outtakes from a Bruce Lee film. And he would do it something 30 times. 
uh, to get that one take that was perfect. I mean, he still had fun. You can see him here breaking up at uh, Che Yoon's leap onto a, onto a mattress at the bottom of the stairs there. And he did have fun making his films, but he did take his art very seriously and, um, he, and his filmmaking very seriously. And that's why he would work so diligently on these fight scenes until they were just perfect. The results are three carefully crafted and meaningful sequences that resonate on many different levels. This is a nice little technique here where he fakes high, or fakes low and kicks high. Here we go. Boom, boom. And again, just the athleticism of the man was tremendous. Well, now we're getting to the part which is, you know, the most significant. The footage that had been put away for 28 years, and uh, a lot of people thought it was lost. So it's, uh, it's really great to, you know, all of the, what's gone behind to take Bruce's notes, re-edit the film the way he wanted you to see it, and hopefully now, when you see this footage and you hear his dialogue as he wrote it, uh, you'll have a better understanding of the message he was trying to communicate. It's such a tragedy that the man should pass away at only age 32, and uh, with this film still unfinished, and uh, has such a great future ahead of him. Um, it's pretty obvious that uh, this film would have been much more than just a fighting film. And that's why I always sort of bristle a bit when people say, oh, Bruce Lee always just that martial art guy, he's like a Van Damme or this or that. No, he wasn't. He was, he was somebody that, uh, that had a message. He was a pioneer, and he was a tremendous filmmaker in his own right. I remember Blake Edwards once made the comment that uh, no one, he didn't know hardly anyone who knew, had a better sense of camera than Bruce Lee. And um, anyway, this is his masterpiece, I think, finally shown after 28 years the way he, he wanted you to see it. So I'm going to sign off at this point and uh, allow you to enjoy this uh, the way you should, without interruption. And I thank you for uh, listening to me, and uh, I hope you enjoy the film.